Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Abhilash Mishra. Uh, I'm a proud Chicago Booth alum, and I work for the school now. I'm director of India and South Asia Outreach uh, for executive education and external relations for the school. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone here in this evening today, uh, especially our colleagues from the NHRD fraternity. Thank you, Dr. Dharanjay Singh, for all your support in this. Uh, our fellow Booth alums in this room, uh, Akshay, wherever you are, thank you so much for putting this together with us. Uh, our colleagues from the U Chicago Center in Delhi and the U Chicago alumni community, uh, Aditi, thank you so much for all your support in bringing this together. Uh, a little background about the center in Delhi. Uh, the center was established in 2014, this place that you're here in today. Uh, in establishing the center in India, the university uh, draws upon a long and rich uh, history of excellence in scholarship, research, and teaching related to South Asia. Uh, the center in Delhi in last four years since it has been set up already serves as a base for undergraduate, graduate, and professional students studying in India. In the last year itself, the center has hosted 100 plus workshops, uh, seminars, and lectures with our faculty, students, and alumni in the region. And over 60 faculty from various departments in U Chicago have visited the center since our opening. Uh, as part of the ongoing endeavor to bring best of University of Chicago uh, intellectual capital to this part of the world, we initiated the University of Chicago Leadership Roundtable Series some time back. And in the same uh, line of thought, uh, the intention is to bring insights, ideas, and perspectives uh, from our current research uh, for the community to this part of the world. Uh, we are delighted to host this evening's lecture by one of my favorite professors, Professor Michael Gibbs here, uh, who's a clinical professor of economics at Chicago Booth. And his study covers a very relevant uh, topic in today's world, will we all be wiped out by, or sorry, replaced by robots. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the apocalypse. Uh, Professor Gibbs studies uh, the economics of human resources and organizational design. Uh, and he's the co-author of a leading textbook in this field, Personal Economics in Practice. And this book has been translated in at least five languages. And the Chinese version, I think, is coming down soon. In 2007, Professor Gibbs received the notable contribution to Management Accounting Literature uh, Award from American Accounting Association and has received three Hillel Einhorn Excellence in Teaching Awards. He earned his uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD in economics, all from University of Chicago. Uh, trust me, when you have a, an economist, and that too from Chicago Booth, talking about HR, the perspectives are going to be very different and you're going to walk out with a different worldview from this room. I was very fortunate, Professor Gibbs, to attend your class uh, while in my program in MBA. And one of your topics was compensation and difference between stocks and options. One of your insights made me a little wiser, a little bit richer after that. And I hope I had paid more attention. I would have been much richer now. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And over to you. Um, it's a pleasure to be back at the Delhi Center. This is the third time I've been here. I was here when it opened. Uh, I was here for Pi Bar, and this is, um, and I, I'm sure this won't be the last time. Um, it's a real pleasure to see, I, as far as I can tell, at least seven of my former students um, in the room from our ADP, AXP, and EXP programs, and some other alumni. And I appreciate those of you who are not alumni coming as well, making the, going to the trouble of coming to our center. And I hope you come often. Um, before I get started, I want to thank NHRD for sponsoring this um, program. I appreciate that. And our alumni club. And I finally also want to mention that I'm here in Delhi on, on funding from a grant received by the, our Tata Center at the University of Chicago. Um, the reason I'm here is to try to start a new research project with a local company. I can't reveal the identity of the company um, because we'll be doing confidential research um, 
but I do appreciate the funding, and that's another reason why I expect to be back and again so, um, as well. And of course, thank you to the Delhi Center and to Abulash um, and Aditi. Um, all right, let's get started. Let's see, is this a touch screen? All right, um, this is a classroom at the University of Chicago, which means that um, you shouldn't be quiet if you have questions or objections or perspectives that you want to add in. Don't be shy, don't hesitate um, to raise your hand and talk at any time. Don't wait till the end, okay? Um, how much time do I have, three hours, three and a half? Yes. Okay, like all right, <laughs> just kidding. Um, all right, so what I want to talk about is, I'm, I'm used to walking around when I teach, so it's a little frustrating, but I've, I've been asked to stand here, so it's a little awkward, but I will, I will, I will comply since this is being put on Facebook. I should probably have a couple of former students um, watching right now. Hi, guys. Uh, I want to talk about the labor market robot apocalypse. Um, this is something that is in the news a lot, has been for about the last five years, and it's something that I think we should all be legitimately worried about or concerned about at least, and I want to try to provide some perspective on if there's going to be an apocalypse or not and why. This, this is based a little bit on some research I've done, but what I'm mostly going to talk about is a lot of research done by other economists and academics and sort of tie it all together. Okay, so here's a couple of example headlines. Um, Merrill Lynch warns of robot apocalypse in the Wall Street Journal last year. In the feed, is your job at risk of the upcoming robot apocalypse? Um, and then Reuters, millions of jobs may be lost to automation in the next two decades. And you can find many, many more of these. And I'm, I'm sure you've, there, there have been some in the India Times and so forth as well. Um, and Many of these headlines trace to a specific academic study that was done by artificial intelligence researchers at Oxford University that I'll mention later. I think that kind of spawned this um, media attention. Um, but in any case, automation is something that has been um, proceeding at a relatively rapid pace recently. I'm familiar with some executives at HCL. We have two executives from HCL in the room today. And I was talking to one of them yesterday, and part of that the conversation was about an automation business. It's, it's one small part of HCL's many lines of business. Um, so you guys, in some sense, are creating the robot apocalypse. You know, you're working for Cyberdyne Systems. Um, that's, the, that's a Terminator movie reference. But this is an old idea. Um, in, 18, in the early 1800s in England, the Luddites were a movement founded by Charles Ludd who was concerned that textile workers were losing their jobs to automation because the first automated textile machinery was being installed. Um, and of course, textiles are a big part of India's economy now in, in some areas, right? And here we have a picture of them destroying the machines in the factories because they couldn't convince the companies to stop firing the workers and installing machines, and they only thought they thought the only thing we can do now is rise up in rebellion. Um, John Maynard Keynes is one of the most famous economists of all time. In 1933, he was talking about automation outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor, and he was concerned that we'll end up with mass unemployment. In the 1964 in the United States, the U.S. government set up one of these blue ribbon commissions of important mucky mucks um, called the Ad Hoc Committee on the Triple Revolution. I'm not sure what the Triple Revolution was, but it probably was telecom and computers and something related to both of those. Um, it had several Nobel laureates and distinguished um, academics and um, government people and business people and so forth and so on. And in their report, they concluded that the cybernation revolution which is a great name, a great movie title. The cybernation revolution would lead to almost unlimited productivity with progressively less labor. And then finally, as I was looking around for articles related to this, I was amused to find an article from 2009 in which French workers had seized their factory and were trying to blow it up, just like the Luddites. And France being France, they did it again in 2017. So these issues have recurred throughout the last two or three hundred years. And I'll come back to that point as well. 
Before I get into that, I'm going to provide a little perspective, and this is actually from some research of mine. I, I did some research with some colleagues, one of which works for the United States Department of Labor, which is a government agency which collects data on the U.S. labor market. And she was able to get us access to an unusual data set. It was a 10% random sample of the entire U.S. labor market, very large data set, which included information on how the jobs were designed. And research of this kind on how jobs are designed is fairly rare. And so we had information on, on four different characteristics of 10% of the jobs in the United States. The first was the extent to which the jobs were, were ones in which your work is closely dependent with your colleagues or you work relatively independently. The second was a measure of the extent to which someone performing this job does many tasks or has a very specialized job. So specialization through multitasking um, continuum. All of us have jobs with, where we do lots and lots of multitasking, but that many factory workers, for example, do very repetitive, simple jobs. The third dimension was the extent to which in your job you're given a lot of discretion about how to do your work. Think about that as decentralization or the lack of it. Is this a job where you have authority to try new things, to choose your own methods, um, and so forth and so on, or it is a job where you're essentially told what to do and how to do it. And then the last was a measure of the skills that would be required for someone to perform this job. Okay, so we did something very simple. We took these jobs, uh, these information about these jobs, and we, we, within an industry and within an occupation in that industry, we had a, a, a set of, peop of jobs which were relatively similar to each other, and then we just rank them against each other. So for every secretary in banking, we, we ranked your, your measure of independence, interdependence, multitasking, discretion, or skills compared to other secretaries in the banking industry. Um, so the way we defined it very simply was if you were at the median, we call that middle level. If you were below it, you were ranked low on that dimension. And if you were above it, you were ranked as high on that dimension. So now we have some simple metrics on the job. We have four dimensions, and we have low, medium, or high. L, M, and H is what I'm going to refer to them as here. And let's see. If there are four dimensions times three dimensions, let's see. What do we have? 64 different um, combinations, I think. I think I know that's right because you're shaking your head yes. You did the math, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, 16, I think it's 64. 64 different combinations of jobs where you could be low on one dimension, middle, medium on another, low on a third, and high on the other, and so forth and so on, right? Now, if these four dimensions of how jobs are designed are unrelated to each other, then you can calculate the expected uh, probability that a job will have, uh, will be each of those 64 categories based on the probabilities that on each of those dimensions, a job in this group of people is low or medium or high. All right, so it's a very simple um, non-parametric statistical test. So we come up with predicted um, likelihood or predicted distribution of job design, assuming these are independent from each other. And then we compare that to the actual um, designs. And what we found was a very striking pattern of those 64 different types Two types were extremely common. They were about 30 times to 40 times more, uh, more observed than would be predicted. And those two were job designs that were low on all four dimensions or high on all four dimensions. The other job design which was more, uh, which is observed more than would be predicted was the one where job was medium all of those dimensions. So these are jobs which, what we see is jobs fall into patterns which are in some sense coherent. You, you tend to be low on all of these four dimensions in the same job, or medium, or high, and especially the extremes, all low or all high. I'm going to call all low jobs classical job design, and I'm going to call all high modern job design. All right? What is uh, the base for expectation uh, purpose? Expected, uh, when you say expected, um, so, so think about it as we have four different measures, and if they're statistically independent or uncorrelated, um, uh, pick discretion. This is the extent to which you have a lot of authority in your job or you're told what to do. 
It, these are, um, so we have three low, medium, high. Those probabilities are going to add up to 100, and then you go from there. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second thing that, that we found, the second pattern was jobs that are high in all of these, what I'm going to call modern job design, um, are in industries which are high, relatively R&D intensive. So they're changing rapidly, they're, um, and, and industries where there's relatively high spending on information technology. So there's a relationship between these and both change in information technology. And I could talk about this all day. Um, I, I've done a lot of writing on this particular idea, but I want to link it back to this question about robot, the robot apocalypse. All right, so why two different approaches to job design, um, extreme ones, classical and modern? The way I think about it is classical job design. First of all, what is classical job design? This is a job where someone does very specialized work, one or two or a small number of tasks over and over and over again. So factory worker is a classical example of that, but very, very simple clerical or secretarial work would be similar. Um, their work is relatively independent of others. They have little or no discretion over how they do their work. They are told how to do their work. And as you might expect in a job like that, such a person doesn't need very many skills and they don't need high level skills, including higher order thinking skills, cognitive skills, because they are told how to do their work. All right, so where are those kind of jobs going to, make, uh, going to be seen? They're going to be seen in cases where we've already figured out the best way to do something. So the, the classical way to do this is to bring in consultants who do industrial engineering, who help a company figure out what are the best processes for designing a factory or designing some kind of um, insurance company's process to deal with claims or something like that. Um, Frederick Taylor was the first industrial engineer, one of the first business consultants in the world. He was famous for helping the Ford Motor Company set up the first mass assembly line in Detroit, and he used exactly these kinds of principles. Um, and when he did that, what, when you're trying to optimize a business process, that's a very difficult problem to solve. And the way you tend to do that is you break up that business process into different pieces, and then you try to perfect each of those. And if that's still too complicated, you break it up even more, and you focus and you focus. And then so you've taken the whole business process, you broke it into discrete steps, and then you try to perfect how to do this step and that step and that step and that step. And in some kinds of work, that is very easy to do. UPS does a lot of this kind of Tayloristic approach. But UPS is a very simple business. Take a package from one place and bring it to another. And they've been in business for about 120 years. And very little technology has changed during that time. They went from bicycles to motorcycles to trucks. They added airplanes in the 1970s. And then there was barcode scanners and tracking of packages in the 1980s and so forth. But the business is pretty simple, and they've had a long time to perfect it. So they literally tell the drivers how to step into the trucks so they could be faster. All right, that's Taylorism. So when you've done that, when you've broken up the process into discrete steps and broken it more and more and more, and, and then you figure out how to do this step exactly the best way, it doesn't take much to then say, OK, we'll have one person to do this and do it over and over again and do it exactly the way we've figured out is the best way to do it. And what does that lead you to? A specialized job in which we don't want you to think and figure out a better way to do it because we already know the best way. And since we know the best way or something close to the best way, we don't want you to try it any other way because the way we figured out is a relatively efficient way. So we're going to give you a, a specialized job with low discretion, and you're not going to need a lot of skills then. And since we've perfected your job sort of independent from everything else, you're probably not going to be too interdependent with your colleagues either, and that's classical job design. All right. Um, and here's a quote from Frederick Taylor's book about his practices, which gives you some idea of, of how he thought about workers. He described factory workers in a steel plant handling pig iron as stupid and phlegmatic, resembling in mental makeup the ox. It's a very inspiring quote. I like to give this quote to my students, you know, just to make you really feel good about yourself. You know, um, what, what's he saying there? I don't want skilled workers. I, I basically want someone who's going to do repetitively what I tell them to do because I'm smart and I've figured out the best way and, and they're not and you get the idea. 
Now let's talk about modern job design. Modern job design is the opposite. When you can't figure out best practices completely in advance, that means there's a lot of opportunities for further learning and optimization as you go. Okay, and when that's the case, you can use the employee as someone who does that learning. So this is continuous improvement. This is ex ante optimization, this is continuous improvement. And for continuous improvement, what are you gonna wanna do? You're gonna wanna tend to design a job so it's relatively complex so that closely related tasks are being performed by the same person or by that person's teammates so that the, the person understands how the tasks work together and can solve quality problems that often occur when two parts of a process don't mesh perfectly. So you're gonna move from specialization to multitasking. You're gonna give them much more discretion because what you want them to do is think and observe and develop hypotheses about problems they see, quality and so forth and so on, and then develop, experiment with ways to do their job better. And once they find a way to do their job better, you want them to implement that way. So you're gonna have high discretion as well. So you have a broader job. There's gonna be more interdependence with your colleagues. And we're gonna expect you to think and uh, yourself and innovate. So we're gonna need a higher skilled person. And every job is on that continuum to some extent. All of our jobs are modern job designs where we're doing lots and lots of innovation and continuous improvement and so forth and so on. Um, but even within an occupation, there's variation and we tend to see those two extremes. And again, I could go on and on, but basically think about this as cases where we already pretty much know, have a pretty good idea of how to do things the right way. You know, maybe this is a restaurant where you've got recipes that you've perfected and so forth. And this is where the environment is changing. So you're gonna do a lot of R&D or IT spending and things like that, and you need to learn as you go because you haven't already figured out the best way, or you're trying to innovate and create the future, like at HCL or something like that, okay? All right, so now let's go back to the robot apocalypse. Um, how, the, through, uh, there has been basically two ways in which automation has affected jobs um, historically. In one case, jobs have been um, replaced by machines. And that's the case where machines are able to substitute for humans. They're able to do the work that humans do. But there's another case, and this is the case where technology has enabled, has complemented the work of humans. And in this case, it's made humans more productive. Instead of replacing them, it's made them more valuable. So to illustrate this distinction, I'm gonna use an interesting example from a book by economists to focus on this issue. Um, it's actually an old example now, but it is a nice example, so I'm gonna talk about it. And this is aircraft design. So in 1962, Boeing came out with a 727, which had about 100,000 parts and could handle about 130 passengers. Uh, this, this development process took 81 months and 5,000 engineers. If you were an engineer at Boeing in 1962, designing the Boeing 727, think about what your job was. You were drawing blueprints, and I mean you were drawing them. You were using paper and pencil and erasers and rulers and compasses and protractors. And you had a calculator, but it was a very crude one with a hand crank or something like that. And it, you couldn't do very complicated calculations. And so you spent a lot of time drawing and, and then redrawing and so forth and so on. Um, and your output would be a stack of paper, all right? And as you can imagine, this was not a very efficient process. This is why they needed 5,000 engineers. And when the work of these 5,000 engineers was combined to actually build the plane, what they had to do is take my blueprints and Abolash's blueprints and Aditi's blueprints and so forth and reconcile all of them. And since they were all on paper and they were done by hand calculations and you know humans make mistakes and so forth, they had to build a full scale model of the plane out of balsa wood to try to make sure everything fit together. All right, and then they had to go back and erase and fix, do the calculations and fix the blueprints again before they finalized the design. And then they finally were able to manufacture the 727. Now, this process wasn't very, wasn't perfect. And even though they tried as best as they could, when they constructed the actual planes out of metal, 
they found that sometimes the parts didn't quite fit together right. There would be gaps between them. If you look at an old plane, you will see a lot of what they call shims. This is a, you know, a metal strip that they use to cover the fact that there's a hole where the two pieces are supposed to fit together or some foam rubber or something like that filling in the gaps. Okay, so these planes weighed 44 tons. And since we're in India, I think I can use the non-metric numbers and you'll understand it. And of those 44 tons, half a ton was these shims, basically a fancy word for duct tape. Now, think about that next time you fly in a 727. <laughs> All right. And their acceptable tolerance, where there would be a gap between two parts, except for the fuselage, was a half inch. Now, you go to 1994, which is a long way of, of, in the past from today, um, but it was a big change from 1962. The Boeing 777 was a much larger plane. It took 52 months to develop. I don't know how many engineers it took, but it was far less. What was different is engineers were using sophisticated cab can software that was developed by an aviation company in France. So now think about your job as an aviation engineer. You used to be drawing with paper and pencil and crude calculators and rulers and protractors. Now all of that stuff is done in computer for you. So what does that mean? This frees you up from a lot of the drudge tasks that you've been doing and allows you to experiment more. What would happen if I changed the curvature of the fuselage? What would happen if I moved this part a little bit that way or a little bit that way? Could I think about customization where I have several different models now because I don't have to spend all this time doing the hard part, the computer's doing that for me. I can think about, I can think more creatively, I can think more innovatively, and I don't have to focus on one design, I can focus on, I can do multiple designs. And in fact, Boeing was able to customize their planes far more. So what happened is we needed fewer engineers, but the engineers that we used were far more productive because the computer didn't replace them. It replaced some of the tasks, but those were the lower order repetitive tasks, the calculations and so forth. And that freed them up to focus more of their brain on the tasks that were hard to, to automate. The design, the creativity, the innovation, and so forth. And that's the pattern we've seen over and over and over again. Most of us were not replaced by computers in any of our previous jobs, and all of us are much more productive now because we have computers and telecommunications, and I can have teleconferences with executives at HCL in Chicago and, and you know, collaborate with them even though they're 7,000 miles away and so forth and so on. Oh, and by the way, they needed many fewer shims and the tolerance was much, much lower, and I'm sure it's even better in 2018. All right, so I've just described how technology has two very different effects on two very different types of jobs and employees. And this is leading to some dramatic effects on the labor market. So that's not the main part of my talk, but I'll talk about it for just a minute. Um, so on the left here, I have a figure from the textbook that Ablash uh, mentioned um, that, I, that I wrote with a colleague, a co-author of mine. Um, and what it's showing is two measures of the relative compensation of high-skilled people compared to lower-skilled people plotted in the United States from 1970 through 2005. And this textbook was published a couple of years ago. I could probably update it now to 2016 or 17. Um, so I'll just show you the one that's closest to me. This is the average hourly wage of someone with a college degree divided by the average hourly wage of someone with a high school degree in the United States. So it's a measure of how much does the labor market value people with more skills compared to less skills. And the point of this figure is you can see the, there wasn't much change until about 1980, but starting in 1980, the relative pay of high-skilled people has risen compared to relative to pay of low-skilled or medium-skilled people. And any way you measure this, any other measure of skills, you find this pattern since about 1980. And this pattern has continued through 2018, and this pattern is global. It's true in India. It's, de it's far more true in India, I would guess, than the United States. Um, it's true all of Asia, Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, and Africa, um, to the extent we can get data from all these parts of the world. It's a global phenomenon. And if I had pushed this graph backwards in time, the last time we saw any kind of change of this significance in relative compensation of high versus low-skilled people was back in the first Industrial Revolution. 
For most of the 20th century, these ratios sort of bounced around but didn't have any trend. Okay, so this is a big deal. All right, so, and, and the reason is because if you're in a job where information technology complements you because you do higher order thinking, cognitive work, creativity, innovation, leadership, things like that, computers make you more valuable. But if you do simple classical job design types of work, those are the kind of things that are easy to automate and you can, you're likely to get replaced or at least you have to now compete with machines or software, right? The second picture is a measure of the change in employment within occupations, so percentage change in employment in different occupations. Um, and, and these are measured by, in, by breaking people in the same occupation into low, middle, or high levels of compensation, similar to what I did with the job design data earlier. This is a picture I borrowed from a study by an MIT economist. And this is data from the EU plus England, um, and what we see, and so this is 1993, <coughs> excuse me, to 2010, and what we see in all of these countries is the same pattern. We see a relative increase in jobs for high paying people, some increase in jobs for low paying people, the green, and the middle is dropping out. So we used to think, based on pictures like this, that what automation was doing was destroying jobs for those with low skills but it's more complicated than that. What it's doing actually is replacing jobs for those with middle levels of skills. Okay, so on the high end, our kinds of jobs are hard to automate, but on the low end, there, there have been, until recently at least, um, jobs which have skills that are, or tasks that are hard to automate too. Two in particular, certain kinds of physical jobs. Okay, so if I was allowed to walk around this room randomly in this unmapped space, that would be hard for a robot to do until recently, but it's really easy for humans to do. Robots and machines have, been very, have not been able to do fine motor skills, um, although they're getting better at it recently. So if jobs involving physical work have been ones that have been hard to automate. Those tend to be low-skill jobs. And the second thing is service jobs where some kind of human interaction is important. So teaching would be an example of a low-skilled job involving human interaction and services. Um, and those have, so, so that's what you see. So if you combine these, you see rising inequality in pay for those who have jobs, high skill versus low skill or medium skill, and also the middle has fewer jobs. Putting those things together tells you why we've had growing inequality, dramatic increase in economic inequality globally since 1980. By the way, why since 1980? Because that's when computers really started to be useful. Personal computers started being deployed by corporations all over the world. Okay? And we're seeing some political fallout from that. Um, no doubt you're seeing some of that in India. What I'm most familiar with is um, Brexit in the UK, because I teach in our London program. Um, and a lot of that is based on fears of my job being replaced. Some of it is misguided and is, is related to fears about international trade, but it's really based more on automation. Um, and in the United States, we have um, Donald Trump as our president, and Barago was a serious candidate, and he's basically a communist. You know? And both of them were successful politically because they appealed to those in the middle skills who are fearing that they're going to lose their job or have lost their job and their compensation is stagnated if they're still employed very successfully, okay? So I'm guessing you have similar dynamics and if you don't, you will. All right, All right now let's go back to the robot apocalypse and away from politics. So there's probably a couple of you in the room who are working in artificial intelligence. Are there, out of curiosity? A little bit, okay. So I, I, I don't understand it very well, and if I misstate something, please speak up, okay? So you, you can clarify. Um, so basically, what I want to do now is talk about recent years. So what I've given you is sort of the story up until 2010 or so. The, the reason things may be different now is because artificial intelligence, while we've been talking about it for about 50 years, it's only in the last 10 years or so that it has started to provide tangible applications in the business world, um, largely speaking. And artificial intelligence is attempts to make computers mimic human thinking, human cognition, 
and therefore might start threatening us in our high school jobs as well. So I want to talk about that. That's where the real fear is coming from. Are things different now because of AI? All right, so there's different flavors of AI. The simplest version is called data mining. So AI is becoming powerful now because we have vast amounts of data and we have really, really cheap computers and we have developed techniques and statistical methods and so forth to put those two together. And um, we didn't have that stuff 10 or 15 years ago. So the first is data mining, where you take vast amounts of unstructured data and you basically look for correlations, patterns. There's no theory behind it, but you can find patterns. You, so those patterns may be able to help you predict and may have applications. A good example of that might be interpreting a, a radiological scan like an x-ray or something like that. Machine learning is the next step up where we're actually trying to get the machine to make some decisions, not just make some rough predictions or look for correlations. What machine learning um, does is it defines an objective for the computer to maximize or minimize, sometimes called a cost function. As an economist, I would call it a utility function. You define an objective for the computer. Um, you give it some initial data and some initial ways to process that data to make decisions, if you will. And you allow it to take that data, make those decisions, and that will lead to some outcomes and, it, and then allow it, and then you keep feeding it new data and you allow it to test out new versions of those decision trees, if you will, and evolve them over time, okay? So the machine is learning in that sense. It is changing its algorithm to better maximize whatever objective you have set up for it. Make sense? <coughs> All right. Yes, sir? But in both machine learning and neural networks... That'll be my next one, yeah. There is the bias of the programmer, which is a part of the algorithm. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that bias will always remain. Or is it uh, the, the way that it's unbiased? Um, to date, we're, this is something that AI researchers are trying to figure out, as I understand it. I don't think they have figured it out. They know there is this problem. You know, if, if tech, technologists are men, the, the machines are going to end up thinking like men or something like that, or, um, you know. Um, and they're trying to figure out ways to develop the algorithms to avoid these biases, and I don't know whether they're going to be successful. It's hard to say. Um, part of the problem is the utility function of, I, as I've called it, here are the objectives that you are supposed to pursue are ones that we have to define, and we define them as humans. So, but I, I don't know much about that, but it's an area of active debate and concern right now. Okay. Um, so, b by the way, let me give you an example of a utility function, what I'm talking about, or a cost function. If you're designing, if you're trying to design autonomous vehicles, one of the things that you have to do is tell the computer who to kill and who to not kill in certain situations. If there are two pedestrians, which one is going to be doomed? Because that decision is going to have to be made. You're going to have to swerve left or you're going to have to swerve right. And the computer is going to have to have some guidance on how to do that. So that's an example. That's a dramatic example, but that's the kind of thing you have to think about if you see how human biases might come in there, right? Okay, so neural networks um, are the, more, the most advanced and exotic version of this where you're actually trying to mimic human thinking. Neural network scientists um, work with um, neuroscientists and try to understand how does the human brain actually work and can we use that to guide our design of, of, of algorithms. Basically, um, there are two parts to that. The first is some level of abstract thinking and the second is some hierarchical thinking. And let me explain what I mean by that. So, it is common now for computers to be able to, to scan a signature and interpret and figure out this is my signature or it's not my signature. Ten years ago, this was given an example of something that computers probably would not do in our lifetime. But because of neural networks, we are now able to do that. So, how did they do that? So, first of all, um, abstract. The first thing that, that the computer needs to do is visually look at a piece of paper and then it needs to say, here's an area where there's dark stuff with a light background, so that might be ink on paper, and focus on those areas, and then focus in more, so that's one level, and then take a look at that and decide, okay, this is a signature, and if it's a signature, then you have to try to parse it. Is this a letter? Is that a letter? Is that a letter? And so forth and so on. That's a next level of, abs uh, of abstraction. It's a different algorithm in some sense, but it's a different step hence the term hierarchical. And then once you think you've defined a letter, 
then you have to have an algorithm that tries to interpret what letter is this, A, B, C, D, and so forth and so on. And, and neural networks kind of work in that direction. There's much more complication to it, and I don't understand it very well, but that's basically what's going on. And that's interesting because that allows computers to do things like um, have visual capabilities, like recognizing a signature, have language capabilities, because exactly what I described is how computers parse language too. Um, um, be able to speak a sentence, it may be an imperfect sentence, but in some crude sense, communicate with humans, and so forth and so on. So they're developing crude social skills, if you will, some visual skills, and the visual skills allow computers to more easily move around an unmapped space or pick something up, so they're getting better at physical tasks too. So this is actually threatening low-skilled jobs too, not just high-skilled jobs, but to the extent they're good at these things, they can start doing some of the things um, that high-skilled people would do. So let me just, here's some examples of the applications we're starting to see, and there are many, many more. Um, most of you are, are familiar with Siri, that annoying thing on your phone, if you have an Apple phone, um, which, which speaks to you um, and tries to interpret your language and often has mistakes, or Amazon's Alexa, or so forth and so on. Um, another example is anesthesiology. Anesthesiology, not anesthesiology, well, yeah, anesthesiology is an example. It is common now for computers to make recommendations about how to treat the pain of patients during surgery. So far, it's recommendations. They're not making decisions, but they're making recommendations for the doctor. Um, uh, the example I wanted to talk about is um, radiology, CAT scans, MRIs, x-rays, and so forth and so on. Um, a college student decided for a class project about a year ago to try and develop a program that could interpret x-rays. He spent about a week on it, ran his program with a lot of data from x-rays, did machine learning techniques and so forth and so on, and almost immediately his algorithm was more accurate than professionally trained and experienced radiologists at detecting, say, a tumor on an x-ray. Imagine if you were an anesthesiologist, um, or, sorry, a radiologist who has student loans to pay off because you went through expensive medical school and you've been doing this for 10 years and becoming an expert and this college kid has come up with a, a machine that can do it better than you. So are, in, are radiologists being replaced by machines? So far the answer appears to be no. What's happening is, first of all, radiological scanning is incredibly cheap now. I remember when there was one MRI in the whole city of Chicago and it was a huge deal and you could never get access to it unless you had the best health insurance and, and some really serious disease. But now, any local clinic can have an MRI machine because they're very cheap. All right, so we have massive amounts of data coming out of these radiological scans. Radiologists have more data than they can have time to look at. But if we can pass all those through a machine, we can process them. We'll have a lot more information that the radiologist can take into account. And the machine can then flag the anomalous ones and say, take a look at this one specifically because something's strange here. And then the radiologist, who's still better at the sophisticated interpretation of those scans, can focus their higher order skills on those and let the machine do the, the, the processing. It's very similar to the aircraft engineers. So radiologists start debating all of this in their journals right now, but it looks, it may be the case that we actually have more value for radiologists and we may actually see an increase in the demand for human radiologists because they're more productive and cheaper at the same time or give better information. So I have to put in a quote here from Satch Nadella, um, who's from Hyderabad and a, a, a graduate of our MBA program because he's the, the CEO of Microsoft currently talking about artificial intelligence. I gave a talk at Microsoft's Innovation Center in Milan last summer. So these were the AI researchers who were um, heading their efforts in Europe. And one of them claimed during the workshop that within 50 years, he thinks that the techniques they're using will be able to do anything humans can do. Anything. Like give this lecture and do my research. I'm skeptical, but that's what he thinks. Anyway, for what that's worth. Okay, oops, yeah. Now let, I wanna go back to that um, Oxford study that I mentioned from 2013. So artificial intelligence research, just Oxford University, wanted to answer the question, 
using the technology that we are developing now and we see coming soon, what fraction of the labor force do you think we will be able to replace by automating their jobs in the next, say, 10 years? So they got a collection of descriptions of different jobs, 700 different jobs, describing what's involved in doing those jobs, secretary or something like that, professor. And they randomly selected 10% of those, and they had their AI researchers read those descriptions and answer the question, do I think I could automate this job soon, yes or no? And then they fed those 10% algorithmically to process, uh, to come up with some rules, machine learning, to then process the other 630 occupations to make uh, decisions about those as well. So they were using AI in some sense to replicate their own thinking. And from that, they then um, took those occupations and looked at the percent of jobs in the workforce that are currently in those occupations and asked what fraction of jobs are likely to be automated, not likely to be automated by occupation in the next 10 years or so. And what they concluded was about 50% of jobs will be eliminated within about 10 years, maybe 10 to 20 years. That was terrifying. And that's where all the headlines came from. Half of our jobs will be gone, done by machines, autonomous cars and autonomous professors and everything else in between. This plot is taken from their um, paper. And it shows on the horizontal axis the probability of computerization of a job. And the different colors are different kinds of occupations. Almost everyone in this room is the light blue, management, business, and financial. Really good news, your jobs are really hard to automate even using cutting edge AI, so you're probably gonna be okay. You know, I figure I'm gonna work another 15 years, maybe 20, so, you know, this, this I, I might be okay too. Um, that's me, education, the light green. Um, you don't see much automation. What's easily, uh, what's likely to be automated? They think a lot of service jobs, which have been hard so far, sales jobs. Now that's not going to be the high-end sales where you're selling um, things with long sales cycles, complicated um, contracts, and so forth and so on, but maybe sales in, in a restaurant or a store or something like that. In fact, we're seeing kiosks where you scan things now, um, and so forth and so on. Okay, so we see high likelihood of unemployment, low and medium here. But this is five years ago. Yes, it is. And yes, it is. Happened. Yes, it, yes, it has. In, in some sense, a lot has happened. In some sense, I'm not so sure. The funny thing about artificial intelligence, um, and, and you can speak to this maybe more than me, as I said, it's, we've had artificial intelligence as a field for about 50 years. And lots of excitement. This is all going to dramatically change everything. And for 20 or 30 years, there was almost no progress. It was this theoretical thing that computer scientists did, and they couldn't get much to do. And then they started making some progress. You know, they could make little robots that could roll around a room or something like that. Um, but, our, but what has happened in the past is artificial intelligence will make a, a leap forward, and then it'll stall. And so what I suspect we're seeing, although we won't know until there's a little bit of retrospection, is we made a leap forward with these... Um, neural network techniques and machine learning techniques, and now we're trying to absorb and figure out how to use them. We're not really refining those techniques at a rapid rate right now, although we are refining them. So I suspect we're at another stall for a while, but I could be wrong. I'm basing this in large part on the assumption that what happened in the past is a pretty good guide, absent other kinds of information. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But in any case, I as I said, yes. Yes. It wasn't based on a broad well, uh, descriptions of 700 different types of occupations intending to, to cover the whole UK labor market, the labor market of a modern economy. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And it's basically focusing on the tasks that have to be performed, not the skills, mm -hmm. which is what you want for this because we want to automate those tasks, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So here's the OECD study, which was done by economists, not AI researchers. So, you know, it's useful to have different perspectives. So thank you for that. Uh, perfect segue. I'm glad we planned that ahead. Um, so that study got a huge amount of attention. So others started collecting their data and trying to look at it with other methods. So 
Some economists at the OECD said, now wait a second, you don't automate all of a job usually. What happens, think about the aircraft engineers, is you automate some parts of the job, the calculation of blueprints, but other parts are difficult to automate, so jobs evolve. Think about a job as a bundle of different kinds of tasks, and some things will be automated and others won't. And when they took that into perspective and used the same data and methods, they came up with a much more, um, much less terrifying um, prediction that something like 10% of jobs in advanced economies, this is OECD economies, I don't think India is in here, um, would be likely to, would be at high risk of automation soon, exactly as this gentleman said. Yeah, right, okay. So I think these artificial, this first study was too alarmist. It was a good study, it was provocative, it got people thinking about an interesting question. Now let me go back through history. So look at this picture. This picture is the distribution of the U.S. labor market from 1850 to 2010. The last year I could get data for this. And what we see is in 1850, the blue was agriculture. Over half the U.S. market was farmers. That's probably India today, right? Right? Massively inefficient farming in India from what I've observed driving outside of Delhi as we were discussing before. Um, so automation already has occurred in places like the U.S. In 2010, about 1% of our labor force is in farming. And as you can tell from me, we're not starving. We have uh, too much food. We export a lot of food. There's been massive improvements in productivity. So there's mechanization. This was the first replacement of people by machines. Um, labor service and service jobs have been a kind of constant. This is still blue collar, but what's really growing is these white collar jobs, job where there's Thinking, creativity, cognition, leadership, teamwork, collaboration, those are the kind of jobs that have grown over time. And the one thing we have never seen in the United States is mass unemployment. You know, despite all of these dramatic changes in the workforce. And then there's another thing that happened in the U.S. workforce, where we had introduction of a new technology that was able to perform um, higher order cognitive jobs as well as lower level, jo um, lower skilled jobs, as well as those who are currently in the labor market. That's when women enter the labor market. You know, my mother had a PhD in physics. You know, and women started dramatically entering the labor market and we didn't see mass unemployment of men. Somehow the labor market absorbed all of this new talent and we were fine. What happens is we find other uses for the talent that we have. If we can do something more efficiently with something else or someone else or a machine, we'll do so. But that doesn't mean that someone's unemployed. That means that the aircraft engineers can focus on designing more complex airplanes or ones that have a, a nicer look and feel or more comfortable or more efficient engines or something along that line. All right? And we can also design new things like computers and projection screens and, and phones and smartphones and so forth. So we build new industries and so demand for labor can continue to increase, it just shifts to different parts of the labor market. So you can see where I'm going here. I really don't think that we're likely to see mass unemployment as a result, even of artificial intelligence, even in 50 years. We'll see a lot of disruption, but history has told us that that wasn't the case. Um, but what I want to leave you with is basically some advice for those of you who have children. And that is, how should you prepare for your children? Because I, as I said, I'm probably going to be okay. I've got 10, 15 years left, maybe 20, if, you know, depending on how my 401k retirement plan does and my health holds out. Um, but, you know, what about children? If you're sending them to college or you're trying to figure out what should they focus on, basically what you should be saying is anything that can be automated eventually is going to be automated as costs of computers and other kinds of technology fall. So focus on the things that are hard to automate. And there's basically three of those things, all right? Uh, one is cognitive skills. So we're always told your, your kids should study STEM, which I think should actually be spelled STEAM, statistics, science, technology, economics, engineering, and math, right? Those are the things that help you problem solve, um, Analyze, diagnose a problem, come up with a hypothesis, develop a way to experiment to test your hypothesis, analyze your data, and so forth and so on. Um, the second is social skills. It turns out that social skills have also been increasing value in the labor market in the last 
two decades. It's just something that um, social scientists had not realized until recently. It's not just higher order cognitive thinking skills, but social skills. And by the way, the most valued people in the labor market are those who are high on social skills and cognitive skills. My son is a computer engineer, and I'm an economist. So those are two professions which are high on that cognitive thinking skills. And I can tell you, the average person in both of those occupations is low on social skills. Finding one who's high on both of those, that's the, that's the key. That's the person who's going to run HCL someday. Great. Right. And then the last one, which I didn't put on here, is creativity. This is the one that's really hard to inculcate into someone. But you know, innovation. Um, coming at things from a surprising angle. So, you know, reading some poetry, taking an art class, things like that, as well as STEM classes, and as well as joining clubs and, and being in sports and interacting with other people. Those are kind of the portfolio that is going to be valuable in the labor market going forward. I think I have ended three minutes early. I didn't leave much time for Q&A, but I'll stay here as long as you want.